Is this fine? Imagine coming up to give a senior speech and getting pantsed in front of everyone. I don't know about y'all, but I would dead ass cry right then and there. Like, that sounds so humiliating. <laughs> and no offense to anyone who has been pantsed before. I understand that I have never been in that situation and I will never be able to speak on that experience, but I see you. And even though that is not at all a similar situation, I'm going to speak on it anyway because how I feel in this moment is how I would imagine getting pantsed would feel. If Mr. McVeigh was here right now, he'd be really confused because this is most definitely not the speech I delivered in front of our oratory class two weeks ago. So I'm just gonna explain myself real quick. Two weeks ago, I had a full speech. It was perfect. I wrote everything I wanted to say, and it was sitting in my Google Drive waiting to be printed and read here today. But on Thursday night, I threw it out and started over. That speech was about honesty. I talked about my struggles with anxiety and depression, my experience as a girl of color here, how mental illness destroyed my family, a bunch of stuff no one knew about me, and in the end, for some reason, I felt like I was lying. It wasn't until Thursday night that I realized I had just written the wrong speech. Contrary to popular belief, I admire Amo. <laughs> like, for real. <laughs> Dining hall performance slash almost ass beating aside, I admire her. <laughs> After listening to her chapel speech, all I could think was, that was so her. That speech was so her. When I thought of what I had written, I realized that I couldn't say the same. Her speech was not the reason why I threw mine out, though. That's fan behavior. On Thursday night, in the basement of this chapel, I cried in front of Martrell for the first time. After the best and worst day of my life, I found myself curled up in the corner of my loft in Het West around 8.30 p.m., crying into some throw pillows. I texted Trout, asking him to go on a walk with me, and within a few minutes, he pulled up to the Hets. I know it might seem like Trout and I are really tight because we hang out like every second of every single day, but the truth is that we are, and at the same time, we aren't. We act so much like siblings, and I don't even know if he knows this, but hugging, discussing feelings, and even I love yous literally make me want to jump out of a window. <laughs> we went downstairs and sat for a few seconds before he asked me, what up? I, not knowing how to explain to my brother that I needed our first ever crying session, awkwardly said, welcome to today's service in the Frank D. Ashburn Chapel. <laughs> we are gathered here today because I've had a terrible day. <laughs> I began to list everything that was going wrong, starting at, staring at the ceiling to keep the tears in, until my voice suddenly cracked and my eyes became waterfalls. That is what I would imagine getting pantsed feels like. I was not only embarrassed, I was embarrassed and there weren't any nearby windows for me to jump out of, so I had to sit there and discuss my feelings in between sobs. I don't know what Trout thought of me at that moment, but I can say for me, that was a defining moment in our friendship. The walk back to the dorm felt like forever, and I wanted nothing more than to disappear into my room and act like nothing happened. Little did I know, though, that Juliana would watch me walk up our stairs and ask, um, are you okay? <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> if you've ever been on the verge of tears, you know the power those three little words hold. So as you can imagine, I broke down. I slid down the steps and quietly climbed into her bed where she made room for me to sit. I said, I just need to cry. I rested my head on her lap and continued to sob into her blanket. After a minute or two, I sat up and said, I'm so tired. I went on to once again explain everything that was going wrong, and after what felt like 10 minutes of ranting, I finished it off with, I'm just so tired. Even though Thursday was the first time I cried in front of Trell, it was not the first time I had broken down in front of Julie, but again, that was a defining moment in our friendship. Part of the BIPOC experience is keeping your guard up. It means not having the privilege of taking a break and as a result, suppressing your emotions. After a while, it begins to take a toll on you. The bottled up emotions snowballing into anxiety, depression, the uncertainty of whether or not you should reach out for help from someone who would never understand you. It's incredibly overwhelming. My struggle with mental health has been difficult, to say the least. 
Between the stigma around mental illness in Latino culture and the lack of resources for BIPOC students at Brooks, fighting anxiety and depression is something I've done entirely on my own. For a long time, I had no one to turn to. I didn't realize that waking up every morning and hating the fact that I was alive was not normal. All I knew was that I was tired of everything and I was ready to give up on absolutely everything, especially myself. On nights where anxiety controlled my sleep schedule, I often found myself looking through my contact list, hoping to build up the courage to send a text to someone and say, I'm not okay right now. But I never came across a name that brought me comfort. I quickly became used to not having anyone to talk to and naturally, I drifted away and found comfort in the corner room on the second floor of Merriman, where I'd stay up writing poems about the life I wished I had. Soon enough, my journal became my sanctuary. There's never been room for me or people like me at Brooks. It's something we fight for every single day. There is no room for me to grieve, celebrate, exist. Even the dorm feels like I've just been crashing on someone's couch for too long. I've had my fair share of highs and lows throughout my four years here, but I can recall only a handful of times where I've truly hit rock bottom. I can't say what exactly led up to those moments, I just know they were the loneliest moments in my life. I can't thank Brooks for this, but in some way, my experience here led me to finding my passion, writing poetry. In times where I did not know what to do, who to turn to, I turned to my journal. All of my pain, sorrows are on here. Writing is just as terrifying as it is liberating though. It means finally letting everything out while also confronting everything you've just let out. As difficult as it was for me to go back and reread some of my work, I began to appreciate the lowest moments in my life during which I produced my most raw and powerful pieces. That is what led me to rewrite my speech. On Thursday night, I hit rock bottom. And, two, and after two failed attempts to talk it out with friends, I went back upstairs and head west to do the only thing I knew how to do. I grabbed my computer, opened a brand new doc, and wrote this speech. I realized that ironically, in those moments where I was at my lowest, I also felt the most powerful. I was already down and I could only go up from there. From the very beginning of my Brooks career, I stood out amongst my classmates as I was almost always the sole person of color in any setting. The so-called representation that the Brooks Magazine had promised me when I applied here was severely lacking. Not knowing how to navigate white spaces, I mastered code switching because I quickly learned that that skill was essential to surviving in spaces like these. The past four years, I've been living a double life, and I was convinced that my two worlds cannot coexist. It's funny looking back now because every single side of me lives in perfect harmony within the pages of this journal. Writing has allowed me to find my place on earth, my path in life, myself. It has given me a place to grieve, celebrate, rest. It's given me a safe space free of judgment. Anything I think, feel, see is between me and that journal. When everyone else was too preoccupied to listen, there was always a new page waiting for me to pour my heart out. This year, I decided to do a poetry independent study with Mr. Hale. Over the last eight months, I've been preparing to do the scariest thing ever, publish my own poetry book. I don't typically share my work with people, and one day, after feeling overwhelmed by the fact that most people here know nothing more than my name, I thought, if no one here will listen to my story, someone, somewhere, will read it. On Thursday night, Ms. Binder, who, you know, shout out to Ms. Binder and Ms. Perkins for making this book, like, actually become a physical book. On Thursday night, Ms. Binder walked over to the dining hall and handed me the first copy of Where I Wander. A culmination of the best, my best and worst moments. It is quite literally my life in a book. As grateful as I am to have found poetry, I wish I would have fallen in love with it for reasons other than feeling ignored by everyone around me. It is a bittersweet feeling knowing that my favorite thing in the world started as a coping mechanism. 
Last year, when a white student said the N-word while we were rehearsing for a performance, I wrote about it. Last month, when a teacher singled my roommate and I out for being the only girls of color in the dorm, I wrote about it. When an old friend said, this is you, while showing me a meme of a girl with ripped jeans, a crop top, laid edges, and hot Cheetos, I wrote about it. And I've kept those thoughts to myself because there has simply never been any room for my story to be told here. Tonight at 6 p.m. in the Art Center, I will welcome the world into my life, inviting anyone and everyone to step into my mind and see just what I've done with those experiences that I'm still healing from. As proud as I am of myself for finding poetry, for overcoming my fear of sharing my work with the world, and for standing up here, making space for my story, I can't help but to criticize a system that has led me to this point. Because despite the positive turnout, I have had to make a conscious decision every day to make the best out of what I was given here. Brooks has undoubtedly broken my heart. It has betrayed me. And every single time that it has knocked me down, I have gotten up stronger. I can't say that I appreciate the hardships because I don't deserve them. But I can say that it does feel good to say, you tried me and you failed. The things I have done in this institution that was never even built for me are beyond what any of my ancestors would imagine. I know Mr. Packard does not like cursing in chapel, but there is no better way to say fuck the system for continuously trying to tear me down, for always trying to silence me, for trying to convince me that I am not worthy, for trying to ignore me, and for failing miserably every single time. Thank you.